In this continuous SDS page or gel electrophoresis, we have a stacking gel and a resolving gel. And the goal is to use this interface right here in between the two gels to make sure that our protein bands get concentrated down using this ion sandwich, as well as the difference between these two kinds of gels with their different porosities. Hey guys, my name is Carter and I'm a PhD bioengineer and founder of Cygen.com. My goal with this channel is to teach you new biotechniques so that you become a more well-rounded scientist. And I really hope you actually go to Scigen.com, which is a website that's a search engine for biology methods, and you can apply the protocols you find there to your molecules of interest for free. I'd love it if you did two things. Number one, like this video, because that shows your support. And number two, click the subscribe button, because every week I'm gonna describe a new bioanalytical technique, and you can keep learning and becoming a better and better scientist that's more and more well-rounded. Finally, make sure you ask all your questions down below in the comment section. So our goal in SDS page is to separate proteins based on their size. And in order to do that, we usually make a gel matrix, and then we add our samples right here inside these wells. Then we apply an electric field, you can see here. And then, because of this electric field, the proteins go through the pores within our gel and then they separate. If none of this makes sense, make sure you check out our previous video on STS page where we go through the details of why this works. All right, so like I said, we utilize a gel matrix that we create in order to run STS page. And this gel matrix could be a continuous gel, or it could be a discontinuous gel. What I mean here is, in a continuous gel, the porosity of the gel stays the same throughout the entire gel because we only have one kind of gel that we make. Here, it's a 4% gel. If you don't know what this means, please check out my electrophoresis video. I'll link to it in the description below. In a discontinuous gel, there are two gels that we create. First, we make this 8% gel, and then on top of it, we stack a 4% gel. And by doing this, we can have some unique properties that I'll describe later, which allow us to focus down our proteins into very narrow bands. A third option is to utilize a gradient gel. These are a lot harder to make, so generally you just purchase them from a company like Biorad. And the idea with gradient gels is that there's a different porosity on the top of the gel and on the bottom of the gel. So, whereas small proteins will migrate all the way down through the top of the gel, they'll get slowed down at the bottom, and larger proteins will slow down a lot earlier because while they can go through the top of the gel, which has large pores, towards the middle of the gel, now the pore sizes have decreased a lot, and in doing so, you have this ability to separate out a much larger range of protein sizes within a single gel, as opposed to the continuous case, where maybe only the largest of proteins will get separated on this gel, whereas smaller proteins will just flow right through it because the pores are so large. So what's so cool about having a discontinuous gel? Well, there's two things. One is that the porosity on the top and the porosity on the bottom gels are different. This allows you to have this phenomenon where protein bands are large and spread out in the gel that has large pores, and as soon as they reach this interface in between the two gels, they stack up. Once they stack up, they can actually resolve in the resolving gel that's at the bottom, which means that individual protein sizes will separate out a lot more in the resolving gel, whereas in the stacking gel, they didn't really resolve much. The protein bands stayed very close together because the pores were so large. The other cool thing is, you can see here, we specifically call out glycine and chlorine ions. And you can see that whereas glycine is behind our protein band in the top gel, now our glycine is at the leading edge of the protein bands in the bottom gel. Why does this happen? And what's the advantage? Well, glycine is what we call a zwitter ion. And what this means is that at the normal PI of 6.06, .06, glycine has both a positive charge 
and a negative charge. Now at low pHs, because of this transition at the pKa at 2.35, glycine actually has a positive charge right here. And at higher pHs, because of this transition of pKa2 at 9.78, glycine has a negative charge as seen here. If none of this makes sense, make sure you check out our section within our IEF video on how pH, pKa, and pI are interrelated. For now, what you need to know is that at pI, our glycine has a neutral charge. At low pHs, it has a positive charge. At high pHs, it has a negative charge. And at intermediate pHs, there's more or less of one ion. At a pH of 6.06, .06, which is the pI, both positive and negative glycine exists in perfect equilibrium in solution. At a pH of 6.8, for instance, there's a little bit more of negatively charged glycine because now it's past this pi and is closer to the pKa2. And at a pH of 8.8, .8, much more of the glycine is in that negatively charged state than in the positively charged state. Therefore, most of the glycines are negative. So the reason why the glycine is here behind the proteins and here leading the proteins is because of that shift in the zwitterion from the positive state of the glycine or the neutral state of glycine over to a much more negative state of glycine. Our stacking gel actually has a pH of 6.8 and our resolving gel has a pH of 8.8. .8. Now you can take all this information we just talked about and consider what charge the glycine has. Now in our pH of 6.8, a lot more of the glycine is in that zwitterionic state. It's close to that pI, so only part of it is negative charged. So because of this, the glycine doesn't have a lot of incentive to move very fast through our gel. And so, whereas our proteins are highly negative, our glycine will actually be partially negative and partially positive, mostly neutral, close to that pi. Our chlorine ions will be negative, as you can see here. So our sandwich is composed of glycine, our protein, and then our chlorine ions in our stacking gel. Now, once you get to the resolving gel, the pH is 8.8. .8. And like I said earlier, a lot more of that glycine is in that highly negative state. So what this means is the glycine actually shoots past our protein and it's a lot closer to our chlorine ion in terms of charge. In which case, now our stack is no longer a stack. It looks more like this, protein, glycine, chlorine, in that order. And because of this, the proteins can easily separate out in our resolving gel, as you can see here. Whereas in our stacking gel, they remained as a block. The glycine and the chlorine were sandwiching all the proteins together. Hopefully, this is as cool to you as it is to me. So by using the trick of having a zwitter ion, we can make a protein sandwich between the glycine and the chlorine inside our stacking gel. But in our resolving gel, we allow the proteins to separate much more easily. All right, so we're now going to go into the practice of discontinuous gel electrophoresis. And there really isn't that much content here because it's not that different from SDS page. I'm going to zip through this very quickly. In step one, we make our casting apparatus just like we would in normal SDS page. If you need details, make sure you check out my SDS page video, which is linked in the description down below. In step two, we're going to create our resolving and stacking gels. Now remember, we have two different kinds of gels with two different pHs and two different porosities. All of this coming back to you? That's great. Here are the compositions of our gels. The thing to note is you shouldn't add these catalysts until you're ready to actually cast your gels. For now, just make the solutions. All right, if you're ready to cast the gels now, first thing you need to do is mix in those two catalysts into the resolving gel solution and put the resolving gel 
into your casting apparatus until this line. Don't fill it completely. You still need space for the stacking gel, which you're going to add on top. Once your resolving gel is done polymerizing, now it's time to add the stacking gel. So what we do is we add our catalyst into the stacking gel tube. Then we pour the stacking gel on top and we add our comb, which is this dashed region up above. The comb allows us to set all the wells inside our apparatus and we leave it to polymerize. Once the gel is done polymerizing, we remove the comb, we add in our samples into the different wells, just like normal STS page. Then we run the electrophoresis and finally we analyze by Kamasi or other staining methods. There's nothing different about discontinuous gel electrophoresis compared to normal STS page except that we're using two different gels with two different porosities and ionic strengths, as we talked about previously. All right, my friends, I hope you enjoyed this video on discontinuous gel electrophoresis and that you're ready to go over to Sygen.com, search for STS page and your protein of choice and find protocols for just your protein. It's a really cool search engine. If you have any questions, of course, ask them in the comments down below and definitely subscribe because you can learn a new bioanalytical technique every single week, just like this one. I look forward to chatting with you again. Happy sciencing.